Welcome everyone to the Modular Clubhouse. And today we've got a very special guest with us. We've got Simon from Midronome. Simon, thank you so much for joining. And it's great that you made um, some time for us in these, uh, well, uh, <laughs> let's just say very uh, interesting times, especially for you, yeah. uh, as you are still trying to launch a product in two days. And that's, uh, that's why we are doing this on a Sunday afternoon in, and not on a Tuesday night uh, where we can both enjoy a nice and refreshing beer. Uh, but then again, thank you so much for making some time for us. And um, yeah, so first of all, tell us a bit about yourself. Wh where did you come from? How did you end up making the actual Midronome? I've read the website, but I want to hear yeah. the, uh, the true uncut version of that. <laughs> okay, that's lovely. Well, so like you say, my name is Simon. I'm actually French and I live in Denmark. And uh, I've been, uh, been a musician for a long time. And my background is kind of IT. Um, like I've studied uh, programming and stuff like this. And basically I quit my IT job. I think that was four or five years ago now. Um, to try to do music professionally uh, and that went very well it was just difficult of course uh, and then uh, COVID hit that was 2020 <laughs> Ooh, yeah. and then all of a sudden I just had a lot of time on my hands and at the same time my friend kind of asking about this device say, oh can you make a device that I could sync my synth and, um, and you know send a click at the same time to a drummer and I was like well okay I can make this and that's kind of the whole thing started <laughs> it was just at the beginning it was just for fun and then Somehow I had time and COVID was meant to last what, three weeks and, and yeah. then it lasted two, three years or something, right? So Absolutely, yeah. So then the, the project kind of took on, got more and more. And, uh, and that's where we are today, basically, two days from the launch. Indeed. So today it's, um, it's, it's March 13th and you are planning to launch this on March 15th. I'll do my utmost to make sure that we release this actual recording ASAP. I always like to do some post uh, processing, of course, and a bit of retouching here and there. Make sure I uh, don't look as tired as I look today. But then again, uh, perfect. But my first question then also is, so how does a Frenchman end up in Denmark? Oh, yeah, that's that's funny. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's been a while now. So I've been living here for 10, 11 years, actually. Uh, I came here as a student, basically, and, and then got a job and never really planned on staying. And... Then, yeah, I just stayed. I, I really like Denmark. It's a really great country. It's really oh, it is, nice yeah. place, very relaxed. The weather is shit, but you get used to it. <laughs> and uh, other other than that, it's actually really great. Like, very... Um, I'm actually living in a town called Aarhus. Um, Aarhus, yeah. Which is, like, the second... Most people only know Copenhagen. Uh, but Aarhus is actually the second biggest town in Denmark. Absolutely. And it's, well, it's the biggest one on the mainland, you might say, right? So, yeah. Yes, exactly. Just above Germany. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, when you go a bit north from uh, from Schleswig-Holstein into uh, Denmark, then, you, uh, but then you're also well within driving distance. And that would be a big plus for me from Legoland as well in Helsingborg. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. That's oh, true. perfect. Great. Now, perfect. Um, uh, you already mentioned, well, you were, of course, uh, trying to make it as a recording musician. Um, so what, what, what instruments are you typically playing? What is your musical background and how, where did this fascination with music come from? Maybe that's the more general question I'd like to ask. Well, I mean, that's a funny thing. Like I'm born, I'm born from a musician family. So mm -hmm. like my, I've, I learned guitar. It was my first instrument, like acoustic guitar. Uh, yeah. It's classical guitar, actually, when I was six or something. And wow. my sisters played piano. My brother played guitar. And he told me, one day he gave me a bass. Say, hey, let's start a rock band together. And that was me <laughs> a 10-year-old playing the bass. And, and then I learned drums a couple of years ago. And I can play a bit of synth. Um, but the biggest irony in all this is I made a device for basically for synth players. And that's one of the few instruments I don't really play. Like, I don't play that much electronic music but it was for my friend who does play electronic music and so it was literally a device for him uh, and then maybe for me on the drums or me on the guitar it's like the connective tissue between the synth players and the rest of the band then yeah yeah pretty much actually perfect so, perfect that's and you said you, you come from a, from a musician uh family you might say um so what kind of music was played uh back in your uh, in your home growing up Oh, it's very, it's a, a lot of French music, actually. I really grew up with French music, like uh, traditional, 
you know, we call it like, yeah. yeah, chanson, like musette and stuff like this. Um, I really mm -hmm. come from, and I guess when you translate that into like an English type um, of music, it's like yeah. singer songwriter, which is yeah. kind of very much where I ended up singer songwriter. And then with the last band I had, the one that was trying to make it professionally, we kind of tried to add like a, a big pop uh, side uh, to the singer songwriter, yeah. basically. So that, that band was the, I'm probably going to butcher the name here. Uh, the old Kinnis or yeah, it's very good actually, bro. <laughs> you didn't butcher the name at all, actually. Yeah. Oh great, yeah. I, li I listened to because you linked to it. Uh, yeah. From the uh, from the Midland Gnome website, so I had to listen to it. Mm -hmm. Extremely upbeat. I, I like it. Uh, it it reminded yeah, me a happy bit. Happy music. Yeah, it reminded me a bit of um, what was that? A band I saw. They were playing. They were opening for Mumford at Sun and Mumford at Sons, actually. Um, Half Moon Run from Canada, okay. uh, but a bit more upbeat than them. But from a musical perspective, that's the, the first uh, association I had. Okay. Uh, no, but great, great music. I uh, love that. So then, <laughs> so what was that big frustration that you had uh, when you had to indeed work with other musicians? Because um, we, I've been able to really look into how the mid renome works and how the actual uh integrations and, and how, how you sync it up i've read that all of that um but what was the impact for you as a musician when you first created the first prototype how is that then how did you work uh with that afterwards well like the very basic uh, the very basic version actually didn't have all these functionalities it was basically just like a way to set the tempo on like an uh, back then we didn't really use sequences anyway it was more mm -hmm. like arpeggiators yeah. And and change it actually. Funny enough, that was like the core functionality for my friend. Uh, it was change the tempo. He wanted to have songs where you know you can kind of accelerate, like play with the mood, and at the same time has the um, have the drummer following basically. Okay, so he had um, so he really wanted to be in control from a tempo perspective then. Yes, basically. Well, it's because like we tried that before actually with him and other bands and also myself and other bands where mm -hmm. we had like simple stuff like you know typical like and just this actually as a drummer it's really hard like if you play live it's nearly impossible to just like listen to that sound and unless you have really good monitoring but even if you have then you kind of need to you know kind of separate it to make sure we okay I mean and it was just like this possibility to say okay now we don't have to worry that much about it. We have mm -hmm. to click. And and then there's like the new open possibility, which I would love people to use yeah. actually live the metronome. Um like to do that live with the metronome is to change tempo live. Like literally do it, you know, not like a planned thing, not say, oh, so we're gonna go from 120 to 140. No, to just say like, hey, let's go guys. You know, I can feel feel the moods and we're going faster, we're going faster, or we're going slower. Yeah. Slower. So then, then of course, well, if you uh, and, and and this is just me, I've been not as exposed to uh, uh, to music making as as you've been. Um, for me, it's been a more recent journey. But I would then understand that say, well, in, in an arpeggiator, you always have a set um, uh, a set speed already. Um, so that that's probably one of the main reasons why a synth player would need to be leading from a well from 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 a, from a tempo perspective uh, but this is also the the main reason why you then chose with a um yeah a synth led or indeed in this case now a, a mid renome led approach and wouldn't it then also be that if you then change something on your synths that those would then be picked up by the mid renome and would then be well passed through to any of the other musicians well, I don't get that. So you mean like changing something on your synth that will send an yeah. information to the metronome? Yeah. So for, from what I've seen, and yeah. this is just me trying to really understand it, is on the inputs from instrument X, let's assume it's a synth, into the metronome, uh, where you actually are expecting something like a clock signal that would then indeed be interpreted by the metronome as to, okay, well, this is the actual rhythm that's being played, uh, yes. defined by the... Uh, uh, the, the, well, the, the pulses per quarter note. And then you, you get that whole more, well, more freestyle approach because if that synth player does indeed decide to up or lower the tempo, it would flow through the metronome and be distributed to anyone else who might need it. Yeah, I mean, that's correct. Um, that's correct, but you need to send a special sync signal though. 
Like you yeah. need to have something so you can either be a WAV file displayed yeah. uh, or the idea with all this was to actually more for, not for live usage, but more for like studio usage yeah. to sync it to your DAW. Uh, and for that, we provide actually a uh, plugin, like a VST plugin, yeah. uh, that will send a special signal, and then you send it to the to the input of the metronome, and the metronome like syncs to that. But, awesome. Yeah. Just to clarify one thing, because I think some people have asked about this, um, like if it could detect the tempo. I know for some Ableton has this uh, function called the tempo follower. Mm -hmm. um, which is, in my mind, it's mind-blowing. But I don't think a lot of people realize how difficult it is to do this, like to just get the tempo from something that's playing, like, yeah. you know, a beat or something like this. And based on the feedback from the tempo follower, it kind of works, you know, it's not 100% perfect. You can't have it 100% perfect because it all depends how it's played and stuff. It needs to be something simple, you know, like probably kick and snare, like put but okay, then you can get the tempo. Then you can that. recognize that, of course, yeah. Um, but my point is like for a computer to be able to get the tempo precisely from just music played, it's mm -hmm. it's very difficult software and the metronome does not do that. I'd be happy no. to do it like in the future and stuff like this, but <laughs> in my mind it's like it's a whole it's a whole different level. Like Absolutely. the device the device was designed to be a master clock. So it's meant to be the master. And yeah. this way where you can send him a send it um a uh, sync signal it's kind of like an extra added basically where then okay in this place it can be a slave to a daw or to something else that's playing a wave file okay and then the uh the input as you said that's a very specific very well uh, almost uh something very specific to the metronome that it's able to 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 accept but it can't just uh, accept regular clock uh, yes. pulses yeah is that something that you uh, did think about, or is that something that you uh, dismissed uh, immediately? So, uh, actually, it can accept regular clock pulses, like you said. Okay. <laughs> but oh, it good. has, yeah. but it has to be regular clock pulses. Like it has to be something very precise. It can't be like a drum beat or something. No. So it, it needs be to like be music. either a twenty-four uh, quarter uh, per quarter note or something like that. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Oh, good. 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 So if you do, so then go back to the scenario I just had. So mm -hmm. if I've got a synth. That's called a sync out, and you know what that sync out is. And I'm changing my BPM on my synth as I go along. That will then indeed well uh, go through the metronome and be distributed elsewhere as well. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Th that's that's the correct thing I want to, to understand. Yeah, correct to some extent. Yeah. You probably need to fiddle around a bit with it and stuff, um, mm -hmm. but it would work. It would work. Awesome, awesome, awesome. That's great. And then, of course, the um, the main thing, because as, as I mentioned, we are the modular clubhouse and uh, we all want to know. So how will this then work with yeah. modular gear and, and all yes. of our, um, because I already read the, um, the, the website, of course, so I know it does. Uh, but could you tell us a bit more about how you came to include that into, mm -hmm. uh, into the metronome? Well, again, that's funny because you're right at the beginning, it was just MIDI. It's very mm -hmm. basic. There was actually only one MIDI port, the first version. Um, and uh, and even this prototype you can see here, I'm just going to bring the camera a bit closer. Uh, it actually doesn't have, like on the website, it says, mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see, but it says on the back that you have the USB and then you have the CV out here. Yeah. Um, but I actually don't have, uh, I have the right electronics for it, but because it's expensive to order like the metal case, I haven't ordered new cases yet for okay. the prototype. So for now, the CV output is here on the side. <laughs> That's a, a well, if it works, it works. DIY for the prototypes, it works perfectly fine. It's just not very pretty. And on the final devices, of course, it will be in the back. Um, yeah. But yeah, and the output is basically, um, so it's basically CV, uh, what I call CV clock. And actually, I've been mm -hmm. struggling with the names. Maybe something you can help me with um, because I always call it CV slash analog clock because CV has nothing to do with clock, right? CV is a yeah. change, control voltage. Um, so Indeed, this is, yeah. This is not a control voltage. It's basically a pulse from zero to five volts. Yeah, so it's uh, it's essentially it's a trigger. It's a, uh, a trigger, it's a trigger yeah. or a, or a gate, and you then define that as a uh, was it uh, a pulse per quarter note uh, PPQN. Correct. Correct. So yes. from a um, fr from a modular perspective, I would just call that a clock uh, typically, and yeah. CV would <laughs> indeed be as you said uh, would be something that has more information than just a binary on or off but that would indeed be something uh, on an analog scale from oh it could, yeah. go, it could go as far as minus 10 to plus 10 volts 
Uh, but in this case, it is indeed a, a, a zero or five volts. Zero five uh, volt, yeah. Yeah. So I would I would just say call it a clock. But then again, it's it's not just for modular because um, even even modern capable modern uh, tools like, for instance, the um, the teenage engineering pocket operators, they mm -hmm. uh, they use well, uh, PPQN as well to clock with, as well as things mm -hmm. like well, you you you, uh, you mentioned some vintage uh, synths on your uh, on your website, but even also things yeah. like the Volkers. Um, the, the the cork ones. Yes, and for me that's also it. vintage, isn't it? Like the cork. Well, the corks Corkers. are. I think. Oh, wow, well, vintage, vintage. And you might also call me vintage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think the. the yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Let me just see because I think that the Volkers were introduced uh, called Volkers somewhere in the late two thousands, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, why doesn't the Volkers have a wiki entry? Yeah, and I think the Volkers Korg is a bit tricky because it doesn't... So that's the thing with the output. You can configure it as CV, what I call CV clock. Mm -hmm. Or you can configure it what I, what's called actually DIN clock, uh, which also is called yeah. SYNC24. And a DIN clock is the one specifically used by the old, like the vintage, in this, in this case it's very vintage, uh, Roland machines like the TR808 and 909 and all these. Yeah. Um, or the NTS1. <laughs> what was that, sorry? Or the NTS1. Okay. I don't know. That's that one, I think that yeah. also has, yeah, that also has SYNC in and out. And that might actually be DIN. I'm not quite sure. Okay, I'll have to look into that. But that's uh, one of the things. And I did have a quick look, and the uh, the Volkers were introduced in, or well, the first couple of them were introduced in 2013. So again, yeah, it's it's nine oh, years okay. old. Yes. Okay. My bad then. Okay. No, no worries, no worries, mm -hmm. because it is indeed, as you say, it is based on more well historical since there was. Yes, uh, that's true. Okay. Might be yeah. Mm -hmm. So I totally that understand that. So yeah. um, could you tell us a bit more about how you, um, what you found working with these sort of crowdfunding platforms? Uh, because initially you were planning to go with Indiegogo. Uh, recently you've made the switch to Kickstart. So in two days, that's going to be a very special true. day, of course. So how, um, how, what, was your, what was your main takeaway? What kind of advice would you have for anyone yeah. in the music industry thinking about launching a, a crowdfunding initiative? Do you mind? I mean, I'm more than happy to answer that, of course. But do you mind if we just uh, go back to the CV a bit? Because I was. Oh yeah, sure, 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 sure. No, please do. Yeah. Um, I'll cut this out. No worries. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> you don't have to. You're welcome to. But yeah, I was just thinking in terms of showing. Um, so if you want, I could even plug the output, then you could hear things. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, that's not, great. Yeah. Yeah. Give me a second. I'm just gonna plug it in. Yeah. No worries. Yeah. Come back. <laughs> You've got a uh, great setup there. What do we see there? That's, I think, M Audio. Quite sure what that is. Right. Have you found mm. something? Yes. I just need an adapter. Um, Yeah, that's not ideal, but okay. and yeah, it's already playing. I can hear it. Yeah, it's lovely. And then this one here. There it goes. Now you actually have both of them. Yeah. Um. So right now, because so this thing has two CV clock actually, mm -hmm. uh, because it's a TRS plug, so like a stereo plug. So you have one on the left, one on the right. Oh, awesome! Yes. So right now, I just separated them with this cable, and one of them is set here, one of them is set here. And uh, and it, they're both like independently configurable. So the way it works, you just go in the setup, and then you can choose your CV type. So that's the CV output type. Yeah. And so default mode is off, then there's nothing. Mm -hmm. Or it can be on, and that's like constantly on. Mm -hmm. uh, or it can be play, and then it's only sent actually when you press play. So when you press play, it's going to send MIDI start to start the sequences and stuff yeah. like this. But at Perfect the same time, too. in this case, it will start. If I stop the drum machine, now they're playing. 
Oh, perfect. Yeah, nice. All right. And when I stop. And uh, and the last one is this one. This could be loud. It's the din uh, din mode. Yeah. Um, and then basically you can just uh, you have CV1, so that's like the left channel. CV2, that's the right channel, and you can configure them independently. So if I go on, so right now it's at one. And remember, you spoke about the PPQN. Yeah, this is so one. Uh, this is one. So this is just a duck, duck, duck. Exactly duck, right. Yeah. And you can go two. And then for small now you have one, 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 and two. And so on, right? And you can have first one, this one, and three, and then this one, and two. Uh, and you can do boop, 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 yep. you know, people think it's a drummer's thing. And you can go all the way to so four, six, eight, twelve, and then if you want. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Love that. So, yeah, very, very configurable. And that's, I would say that's kind of very the key in the metronome, just generally. Like, everything is very much configurable, so you can tweak the things however you want them to be. Um, yeah. to your liking. Well, and one thing I didn't know was indeed that you had uh, two CV outs, and that is, yeah, that's great because of course even in in modular, uh, but also in, in analog synthesizers overall, uh, you do have a very broad well, spread. What kind of PPQN uh, is accepted? So you can indeed go from one all the way to twenty four. So that's really impressive, and just the ease with which you were just able to, well. Just demonstrate how it works uh, with the with the click wheel and everything. That is really impressive. Mm -hmm. So, have you have you nice. received any um, any pre orders, so to say, people that say, well, anyway, the the Kickstarter goes, we uh, we want in. Actually, yeah, quite a lot. Like uh, we just opened about two weeks ago this insiders community, mm -hmm. uh, which you're now a member of. Welcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> thanks thanks for the invite. Absolutely. I but yeah, uh, so like the idea with this insiders community is really to get people like some of the people are really interested and they want help basically. And I'm actually really stunned and amazed how nice people are because we I really ask them and I'm happy to give something uh, like free devices, cheaper devices or early access and stuff like this. And the general feedback I got from all the insiders that have been doing already quite a lot, uh, like they've been sharing and speaking about the device, answering questions and everything. Most of them just said they just want to see the products like on the shelf, basically. They just wanted yeah. to see it get to life. They um, want to see it being successful because they see the actual value in it. Yeah, exactly. That's that's just amazing. But uh, so these people are definitely interested. But then even outside of the community, I would say my guess is we have a good chance of selling maybe about about 50 to 100, I hope, on the first day, like all the people that are already ready to buy. Fingers crossed, absolutely. I would say, yes. Um, but the goal is quite high. I think we need at least about 400 to reach the actual goal on uh, Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. uh, which was your question earlier yeah um but uh and that's uh yeah that's i hope we can make that goal because if we don't make that goal we won't be able to go into production and then this whole project kind of falls yeah falls because then of course then <laughs> the actual production costs per device will be too too high to be for it to yes. be feasible yes Absolutely. exactly and and then of course the well the question does become how much are you gonna throw these on kickstarter is that already been defined or is that still a big surprise? Oh, you mean the price? Yeah. Yeah, the price that's uh, defined, it's actually written on the website already. Mm -hmm. uh, like we've had that price for a long time. Um, and that's the thing actually about this device. I come from a, I don't know, I guess it's just my own personal opinion, but I don't like to pay expensive things. Like I have, this is actually a recording studio where I record people and I don't own very fancy microphones. I've never paid very, like, I don't like, to spend a crazy amount of money on gear. Usually mm -hmm. I buy gear because of their usage. It's like, oh, it does what I need to do and it does it well, great. Uh, as long as it's not gonna break in like a couple of months. Value for money. Exactly, really value for money. And, and you know, people always say like, there's like the really, in my mind, there's like three categories of prices. They're like the really cheap stuff. And like when it's mm -hmm. super cheap, it's like as cheap as possible. Mm, you know, it's all made as cheap as possible. I don't really trust this stuff. And then at the top, you have like the the very fancy things, you know, and usually they like established brands that have been there for years and years and people buy it. No offense to them, but for me, like people that buy this, it's just to buy it for the brand, right? It's like, it's fancy, mm -hmm, it's good looking. Mm -hmm. If you think about microphones, for example, like a good example is like Newman and... Uh, um, 
And yeah, no, I try to find Moog, actually, in the synth world. I mean, yeah. Moog, they make amazing synth, but like some of them are insane expensive. There's this Moog one they recently released. Yeah. That's, uh, it's just insane. I just need to spend that much <laughs> amount of money. So in my mind, that's where the, the metronome is. It's not the top and not the bottom either, but it's really like in the middle, kind of, you know, affordable stuff, but practical and like well-made and um well designed that's how i see it it's like it does yeah. the job it's not overpriced it's not underpriced either uh, because things cost and you like i'm sure some people could try to make this even cheaper but then um you know i actually challenge them to try to make it cheaper because i've i've worked really hard to make it as cheap as possible um but without compromising on the quality and you know still having like a metal case and there's like good knob like i spend a lot of time Mm -hmm. testing knobs that sounds stupid but just to make sure you know you had like the right feel that it wasn't too wobbly and stuff like this mm -hmm. and uh, I can see why this thing costs because first it's a lot of my time it's a lot of trial and error and uh, of course this has a cost no but uh, especially with one of the comments you made earlier where you said well I, I truly see this happening in a live setup then you need mm -hmm. to have something yes. that you can just throw in your gear bag and not show up at a uh, at a gig and saying well i'm sorry guys mm -hmm. my midronome crashed or uh, the knob fell off i can't play tonight <laughs> yes. uh, that's of course the worst thing that can happen so you need to yeah you need to rely on such a mm. thing of course I agree. I agree and especially well as you said well you need to truly throw in a lot of uh, uh attention for detail when you're then looking for something that needs to be responsive enough to play with like the knob that you just pointed out i was I was so happy that I just saw you, how you use that, because that really taught me a lot of things uh, about what the nice. actual usability was. Yeah. And That's then, of true. course, yeah. yeah. That was literally what my friend said, actually. When I sent him the device, mm -hmm. he was like, oh, it's snappy. You know, it's like you press a button. You don't have to wait like a second or half a second for the thing to load or anything. No, it just happens. You press, you turn, boom, everything is that like, instant. Yeah, it's um, instant, you, yeah. You saw, right? So you don't have to think that much about it. You press, you turn, you validate, you change something. Okay, you can change. Nice, yeah. Like everything is easy. And so you uh, you mentioned you've got a uh, you were formerly uh, educated within IT. Um, so on the one hand, I can I can uh, immediately see what kind of uh, skills you brought to the table to develop this thing. Uh, but that overall approach to usability. Is that something that you got from that IT world or just being a musician mm -hmm. and knowing what you wanted? As really the musician side, like I have this weird kind of slight hate of laptops on stage. Like for mm -hmm. me, laptops should not be on a stage. Like that stage, you know, it's a place with a lot of beer and a lot of people dancing, jumping and people <laughs> move fast and stuff. It's like laptops are fragile things. They shouldn't be yeah. there. And that's, that's actually the whole idea of this. It's like, you know, it's solid. It can fall which, by the way, we have made an actual test. Uh, we put that in our main video that we're going to have on Kickstarter. That's now on the website where we yeah. actually took a metronome and we actually had to shoot this about 10 times. So it actually fell. The metronome actually fell 10 times. Um, and it still worked. Uh, yeah, it still worked. It, was, it had a scratch, obviously. Uh, of course, yeah. But it works perfectly fine. Like, yeah. in, Well, a quick note on the videos you produced. Um, well, first of all, major kudos for both of them. The actual, okay. the, the dark one, that looks absolutely <laughs> polished. Yeah. I'd love to be able to make so, those kind of videos. So uh, kudos for that. But the same thing is for the full presentation video. I'm like, okay, wow. That's, well, a lot of effort has been invested into that already. So did, did, you, help a lot, did you have a lot of uh, help from friends or did you actually have to hire people for that? Or Yeah, I hired, yeah, 100%. I mean, he's, he's kind of a friend, um, but I hired, I hired him and he, he costs a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he did an amazing job, so I'm really not complaining. Um, yeah. It's a really nice job. It's, he's, uh, he's, his name is Adam, actually, and his website is adamfilms.dk. Uh, it's on the Perfect. YouTube. Uh, it's on the YouTube. Uh, I'll make sure to link to uh, to his channel yeah. as well. Okay. And then, uh, as, as you said, the the price is of course on the website. So for those of you who haven't seen that yet, so the regular price is one hundred and forty nine euros. Yeah. So that'll be the but... price after the campaign. Yes. <laughs> Indeed. So what's the price during the campaign then? So during, so during the campaign, we have three prices. We have the super early birds, which they're going to be like very, very limited amount of. And yeah. uh, my guess, 
slash my hope would be they go in like like that like in, perfect in a I don't know maybe an hour in a half beat, an hour. yeah yeah yeah, and then we have the early birds price. So the super early bird is going to be uh, 89 euros. So that's yep. 40% off the retail price of 149. Oh, wow. Uh, then we have the early birds, uh, which they're going to be a little bit more than the super early birds, mm-hmm. which are, uh, I have to remember, 109 euros. Still, wow. Uh, so that's still like a good percentage off. It's like 26%, I think. Something like uh, that, yeah. And then the final Kickstarter price, it's still not as high as the retail price because we think, you know, obviously people are buying a device before it's made and stuff. It's not mm. the same as going on Tommen and you pay and then in three days you have your device. Um, so I respect that and I understand. So obviously, it's not the same as the full price, but it's still 13% off. Um, so that'd wow. be 129 euros. Still, that's great. Are you able to make any margins on that? Wow. <laughs> well, to be honest, it's like, I would say the, you know, the super early birds is kind of a present because, yeah, the, the margin is pretty much zero on these. Yeah, of course, um, of course. But that's okay. It's like, for me, I'm, I think I'm just really excited to have people, you know, to just have the device and use it. And I, I really hope for the future that, you know, all these people would actually buy the device would that also really help spread the word, right? Because absolutely, yeah. they will have a device, they can hopefully make videos about it and speak about it to their friends and stuff. And then the words go on, and then we can sell stuff retail afterwards. Absolutely. And, and as you said, it's on the one hand, it's giving to the community but also indeed to make sure that this device ends up in as many possible hands as can be. Yes. Because those absolutely. will be the ambassadors going mm-hmm. forward. Absolutely. absolutely. No, perfect. Yeah. yeah oh, in terms of great. numbers, Ashley, it's like I'm much more interested in selling a lot of them than selling them like to have a lot of money. I'd rather sell no, yeah. 10,000 at a lower price than, than sell 1,000 or, or 100 at a much higher yeah. price. Perfect. But hasn't no one reached out to you and say, well, we're going to stop this Kickstarter. Uh, I'm going to offer you a position and we're going to do it within our company. Has Not that yet. happened? Not yet. Oh, wow. <laughs> Not yet. And you know, the feedback from the industry is very interesting because early, uh, it was something like a year ago, mm-hmm. I sent actually the design and like the idea and everything to a guy from Yamaha. Oh, wow. Uh, I won't give his name, obviously, but he was of quite course, yeah. like high positioned. He was like a product owner or something like this. One guy that decides of which product should go in Yamaha. And uh, and his feedback was like very honest. He was like brutally honest. He basically mm-hmm. told me it's a great idea, but it's 15 years too late. This would never sell. And I was like, OK, let's see. <laughs> Ooh, so, that is uh, that is a challenge if I've ever heard one. Yeah. It's so it's tough. Wow. So he did not believe in the product like being, you know, viable for market. Um, and his idea was, you know, people don't use old type gear now. They all use like computers and stuff. And I'm like, well, you know, you're the proof of this, right? Like uh, yeah. a lot of people are really into modular gear and vintage gear and they love having hardware stuff. Not everybody loves the laptop and the amount of people that said, oh, I love a doorless setup that they, for them Absolutely. it's like the dream, right? No, absolutely. And that, that, that was exactly the segue I wanted to make as well, where we say, okay, this fits entirely with the um, with with one of the trends that we've seen, exactly like you just explained, where we don't feel like we want to have laptops on, on stage. No. We want to have, and it doesn't necessarily, there are some purists out there that say everything needs to be analog, uh, <laughs> but in all honesty, that is a niche within a niche within a niche, and yes, those those people too far. <laughs> deserve deserve their spot as well. Uh, yeah, but just true. well, just uh, so so you know. So I uh, really dove headfirst into the synth world uh, a bit over a year ago, and the NTS one was actually the first synth I bought. And if there's one thing that I've learned about the synth community is they are so extremely supportive. So I truly see that um, just, well, the usability that you've just shown will be of tremendous uh, uh, worth to them as well, the actual value it represents. Uh, Because the immediate, uh, well, um, impression I had was, hey, we've got something that resembles, and I'm not sure if you know of this uh, this module, uh, the PAMS New Workout by uh, ALM uh, in in the UK. I it's do one not. of the. That is amazing. I would love to hear about that. But that is 
uh, it's, it's not the same, but you might, from, from a usage perspective, you could use it like that. But one thing that uh, your uh, uh, midronome has that the PAMS New Workout doesn't have is indeed that connection, that immediate connection to, okay, but how can it respond to mm-hmm. outside things and how can it route and then what's the usability? Um, and then again, modules and, and modular is not for everyone. And there is probably like, if you've got synthesizers as a as a niche then within niche you've got modular and then within that modular niche you've got Eurorack and mm. well, the, well the rabbit hole goes down even even further but just going by the sheer success that the PAM's new workout had uh, from ALM busy circuits which is probably like one of the most popular modules out there I immediately see that this is going to be well uh, great going forward uh, especially in like you said, if you do want to play with others, but also in a studio approach where you say, hey, I've got all these synths. I've got a drum computer here. I've got a lead synth. I've got a bass synth. I've got maybe like five to to seven different desktop modules playing around. How am I going to keep that in sync? And how do I make sure that I can talk from this device from 2022 to that device from 1970 mm, that true. I paid way too much money mm-hmm. for? How do we make sure that yeah. we can talk, that, that those things can talk to each other? Mm-hmm. And we've always been able to get that to work, but not this elegantly, at least not in my opinion. And I said, I'm, I'm a total noob in those kind of things. Okay. Uh, but from from my initial point of view, I, I, I love that approach. So could you tell me a bit more about the... Um, and this is me being being in IT and wanting to understand the inner works a bit more. So did you actually base this on uh, an off-the-shelf board or is this something that you customized, uh, had to order the whole PCBs and everything? Or I mean, right now, yeah, it's 100% customized. It's nice. uh, 100% mine, I would say. <laughs> but the Great. very, very... Uh, basically, that's how I started because I'm not an electronics engineer and that's kind of funny mm-hmm. how I've learned so much about electronics over the last two, three years for this project and I had I had help from professional uh, you know experienced uh, electronic engineer and all of this um, which was very necessary basically uh, but the very first version was based off an Arduino if you know this small yeah. board yeah, yeah absolutely um, so that was like the very very first version the one I made for my friend basically and then I just made a separate PCB like a separate board with the chip of the Arduino but it was still my own board and and then I changed the CPU and then it went on and on and on and at this point it's yeah it's it, there's nothing literally not a single component left from the Arduino. Um, oh, nice. So so what kind of uh, core are you running in that? It's like Cortex or? Yeah, it's NAM Cortex. Correct. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So apologies for the rest of the audience that are now tuned out when we started to talk about processes and those kind of things. <laughs> no, perfect, yeah, perfect. Okay. So yeah. if you. If you then look at the potential that the Midronome has. Um, what do you, you think is the biggest competition? What's the thing you're, well, not what's keeping you up at night or what you're worried about, but what do you see as being the uh, the biggest challenge or the biggest, hmm. um, the biggest, well, competition for this? Well, I would say it's funny because we have two main groups of users. Um, mm-hmm. And also I realize I've been speaking a lot about the first one, which are like the, the live users, because this this is where I came from. This is what the kind of the original idea of the device was. Yeah. But then there's the second group, which is the studio users. Yeah. And uh, this is much more your audience, I think. And um, and that's also one of the reasons why I added stuff like the CV output, the DIN output, and the synchronization to the door and everything. Um, and these people, for these people, it solves a specific problem, which is a a door is not good at sending MIDI clock, basically. Like if mm-hmm. you ask your door to send MIDI clock, oh, it's not going to do it very well. Uh, and so many people have problems when they record and there's like latency issues. Sometimes there's jitter issues where the clock is not precise enough and the synths start acting funny and all that stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. While the device syncs uh, via audio, so then it's much more precise, and then it sends a stable and solid MIDI clock basically to all the devices. And at the same time, the CV clock and the the DIN clock, uh, if necessary. But so basically, to answer your question, um, there is another company that solves this problem um, that is very well known on the market, uh, and I think a lot of studio users use. 
the feedback I heard from the people using these devices, though, is it was very expensive. Mm -hmm. That's literally what everybody says. It's like, oh, it's a great device, and I have no wonder they made an amazing job. But it's, in my mind, it's very expensive when you think it's just a tool. Like people, there's something about these people. They're happy to spend, you know, thousand dollars or thousand euros on a synth, but they don't want to spend five hundred euros on a tiny box that are going to synchronize their synth. <laughs> and that's where I feel like, okay, I mean, you know, it's not meant to do everything. It's not meant to be amazing. And that's also why sometimes I kind of put a stop when a lot of people are asking me to add some functionalities. Yeah. Um, and actually, we're discussing this on the forums on the yeah. Regionum. Um, and it's very interesting discussions. And I, I love these discussions. And I'm, I really want to include all these things. But there are a lot of stuff where I feel like, okay, but that would raise the, the price of the device. It's like, it's a lot of work. It would be both a lot of software, maybe hardware changes. And then the price can't be the same. And I'm thinking... I don't want the price of this to rise. I think mm -hmm. that I think that would suck. So yes, to you want to keep it lean and mean as well. Exactly right, and yeah. and and simple as well. Because I mean, right now, like the the, the whole interface is literally just this screen, yeah. four buttons, and a knob that turns, and that's it, right? So you can't have a because of the interface is so simple. You can't like have a menu or something like this. You can't have too many settings on there. Yeah. And you want, and you also don't want to become a menu divey sort of device where you need Either. to have the the manual open right next to you if you want to get something done, especially not true. on stage, but also not when you're in in, in your studio. That is true. Actually, it's easy to use. Um, that's yeah. true. And also but the then, responsiveness that why, why, the, the the feedback you got from one of the first testers where he said, "Okay, well, it's snappy, it's responsive, mm -hmm. it does what you want it to do," mm -hmm. and yeah. And it's just a cute little box. It is cute. Thank you. It's <laughs> lovely red. <laughs> well, like and, and, and the Dutch in me is immediately drawn to the orange. Or is that red? I'm not quite sure. Which the side way? The side panel. It's uh, yeah, it's reddish. I guess it's hard to see on the camera. Yeah, it's, uh, ah, it's red. Just, just, orange. just call it orange. orange. Just call it orange. Just call it orange. <laughs> I always thought, you know, this is actually inspired from the, the keyboard uh, Nord, if you know Nord. Oh, the, uh, the Swedish ones, yeah. Yes, and I always feel like it's because in Denmark, everybody, and also just generally around the world, I think, like on stage, you always see like one red keyboard and you know it's an odd. And mm -hmm. I'm always thinking, you know, if people see a little box and they see a bit of red on the side, they will know it's a metronome. That's kind of a... <laughs> my... It's like the USP, like the unique selling points. Yeah. Yeah, you could say this, yeah. But it so is, basically, uh, to, yeah. to speak about competition, I mean, so there is that one main competitor for the studio usage. Um, but for the live usage, uh, there's not that much. There's not that much competition. Like, and that's the and that's literally where the device was created out of need. It was just there's nothing in the market that can do this, uh, except yeah. okay, a laptop with uh, an interface, and so not only is a lot of stuff, it's a lot of cables, and it's complicated. And a lot and of risk. Great. A lot of risk and time. And you don't and you don't want to be that guy that uh, <laughs> whose uh, Windows or macOS update yes. starts during the middle of your. Uh, Show. <laughs> yes. You know, it still happens. My girlfriend was at a concert of a big DJ, uh, Danish guy, uh, something like a month or two ago. And his oh, laptop. I saw some pictures from that. Yeah. Maybe you saw it. Yeah. And his laptop crashed two times during the show, two times in front oh, well. of, I don't know, thousands of people. It was insane. No, well, I saw I saw, I saw a picture of, um, uh, of a, I think it was a DJ, or at least uh, it was a one man show. A couple of thousand people in a venue, and then a couple of big screens behind him, right next to him, and immediately as he saw Windows is uh, updating your system. Do not press oh. the power down button. Oh god! <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, that's yeah, well, that's so one awful. of the reasons why you want yeah. dedicated devices for these kind of things. Yes, exactly. Because typically the the updates uh, window for Windows is typically like one or two a.m. Which is great if you're just working, but if you're mm. in a venue. <laughs> but right. at least I felt sorry for the uh, the person that was uh, that was playing. Absolutely. Yeah. So again, um, from uh, from from where you see right now, and all the feedback that you've received, you said you well, you received a lot of feedback where you said, okay, I, I I can't really do that because it would increase the cost. It would increase the. Um, uh, well, all, all sorts of other things, uh, but also might be able to impact the usability. Uh, but what were the, let's say, the top three things that 
you did incorporate from feedback from the community up until now? Well, actually, I mean, if you say did, because like we opened this forum uh, mm -hmm. quite recently with the new January, features. January, right, yeah. Uh, yeah, some, something like a month or two ago, yeah. And so we're still discussing, actually. And uh, in my mind, we're still under discussion. Like, as long as I haven't started manufacturing, I don't. as long as I don't have the final prototypes, we can still add stuff uh, yeah. or we can still debate. So it's still in progress. But if you think about stuff that has been added in the past, well, then actually, I want to say all the all the studio stuff, like the synchronization to door, because that wasn't there at the beginning. The uh, the CV out, ironically, that wasn't there at the beginning either. That was also mm. like a demands. People say, oh, why doesn't it have CV out? And I was like, yeah, it should. And and then all this stuff like uh, the pedal control, uh, that was actually yeah. there from the very beginning. There was like just one pedal, like a basic pedal. But right now there's like, you can plug two pedals and each pedal can do tap tempo, it can do play, it can do mute. Yeah. Um, then you can also plug in a drum pad. Um, so there was all these functions that were added basically based on feedback of people that I gave them to. And they say, mm -hmm. oh, you know, it'd be really nice if you did this. So we used it on the live and and it was like difficult to kind of set the tempo and the time signature. And then I told them, okay, I found a solution with the drum pad, for example. So um, uh, just to go back to that pedaling, <clears throat> because I, I did read about it in the documentation. Uh, but if I interpreted it correctly, you could actually just, in, uh, just connect a, um, just a, a normal foot paddle or a regular uh, drum uh, outputs with a quarter inch jack and just use that as or as a tap tempo, right? Yeah, 100%, yeah. Like the, the awesome. drum pad is basically, if you have an electronic drum set, you take any of the drum pad. It's it's uh, from an electronic electronics point of view, it's basically a piezo uh, yeah. microphone that's inside and that reacts to it. So it's a very dumb thing. So any actually, you could even make your own, like you can buy this piezo microphone for a dollar on eBay. You put this and then you put something like a sheet on top of it and there you go, you got your tap tempo that you can hit with a drum pad, with a Absolutely. drumstick. Um, but uh, so that's the drum pad. And then for the pedal, yeah, we accept actually uh, the sustain pedal. So any, any, you know, it's like a foot switch basically yeah, yeah. Uh, that you use on, on your MIDI keyboards or something, but you also accept the latching foot switches, the one that I use for guitar Ooh. amps. Yeah, 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 of course. Uh, and this is nice, actually, because it's like a lot of guitarists. Uh, there was one guitarist who was using this, and that uh, his first reaction, actually, was he plugged his foot switch, and he was like, oh, it's weird, I need to press two times for the pedal to activate. And it's because it was latching, right? And so so now we've updated <laughs> this, so uh, you can just configure it. And again, it's one of these easy, we just go into setup, and you just choose uh, pedal type, and then you choose um, latching uh, or sustain, basically. Awesome, that's great. And then talking about the actual software and the and the number, of, because a lot of these features were, of course, just implemented using software updates. Um, is that something that people can go and do afterwards if you release new firmware? Mm -hmm. Can they can they up, upgrade it themselves? No, that's that's a, that's a cool thing. And I would love to do this. But again, for me, that's like another price range. It's a lot Absolutely, more work. Yeah. And uh, the funny thing is actually I'm considering, and I haven't decided 100% yet, but I'm considering actually making this entirely open source and open hardware. And if it is, I think we're going to provide instructions on, you know, how to upgrade the firmware yourself, how to change bits in the code and stuff. The code will be available and nicely commented and stuff. So if people want to nerd with it and play with it, add some stuff, then they can go ahead. Um, but what you're speaking about now would be like a nice, you know, like a software that we give you, then, then you just use the USB plug and then you can upgrade the firmware. And for me, yeah. that's like another level. It's a lot more code, it's a lot more work. Um, uh, because of the, uh, the maintenance on that? Yeah, both the maintenance, but also like the codes. It makes the code a lot more complicated to be able to update itself, basically. Well. It, 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 and this is, again, I do apologize for getting a bit too technical here, but there are, of course, certain platforms like, for instance, TNC uh, mm -hmm. and, and other mm -hmm. comparable platforms that do uh, offer Cortex support and offer that upgradability without adding the additional overhead to the actual developer because that's already been taken care of by the platform itself. I've got... Um, and that's something that I've learned from the from the modular background because I'm not a um, an embedded software uh, specialist, uh, but just diving into modular where a lot of the modules are indeed based on things like TNC, TNC or yeah. other mm -hmm. or other um, uh, platforms too. 
where you can indeed piggyback on top of that. And we do have within Modular several open source, well, modules uh, that are well, really embraced by the by the community. I think that if we mention Emily from, from Mutable Instruments, who's released every of her um, modules as open source and okay. who are then being embraced by uh, by smaller makers that make their own well spin-offs, but also larger players like yeah. Behringer, who then take that and 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 give it their own approach to it. Uh, but also really open source capabilities that just said, okay, well this is the software, and please go ahead and build your own modules surrounding mm -hmm. that, like the ornaments and crime uh, module. I think yeah, um, I won't give you any advice or the or on whether or not to go open source. I think there's a lot of uh, pros and cons to both of that. Um, but, but still, an, yeah, yeah, it's an amazing idea, actually. Yeah, I, I, I love the idea. Um, and it's true. I've, I've actually spoken to another creator from Denmark who made a very interesting uh, MIDI pedal, actually. Maybe you want to interview him as well. Oh, uh, <laughs> which one was that then? Uh, it was, uh, again, it's still a work in progress. He hasn't released anything yet, uh, mm -hmm. but he has a website. Um, uh, I could, I can give you the information. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, sure later, if that's okay. Give it to me because I'm always loving to uh, see what the uh, the maker industry is, is up to. Yeah. Uh, but I was also indeed make sure because you're doing much more things than just uh, aiming this as at modular, but the whole um, DIY approach and the whole well, do I want to make this open source? Do I want to make this Creative Commons or anything else like that? That is something that is very uh, well, let's let's just say very broadly discussed within the modular and the Eurorack sphere as well. Okay. Um, so I would, for you, and I don't want to tell you what to do, but Please. there are a lot of good <laughs> things if you read up on uh, on things like the ornaments and crime, uh, but also indeed the whole discussion and the whole threads on how, for instance, someone like Emily from Mutable Instruments, how she reacted to well, Behringer uh, making a clone of, of her devices. Um, and that is something that I was, I've been truly amazed with because at the end of the day, this is your day job, right? This is, yeah, this is 100% my day job. It's more than my so, day yeah. job. It's my day, night, weekend, <laughs> uh, pretty much any time yeah. job. <laughs> for, for those of you who are listening to this, uh, this recording currently, so this is a Sunday afternoon. It is uh, 4 p.m., uh, Central European time, and yeah, Simon has uh, has graced me with with his time to discuss all of this. So yes, I can test to the fact that he is working throughout the weekend. Oh, Sunday, um, yeah. So what did you end up doing yesterday during your R and R day? My R and R day. Yeah, rest um, and relaxation. Oh, that's true. Oh, yeah, you did write this. Yeah, I went actually for a bike ride. I was. Uh, it's really sunny. Oh, Dutch of you. I just, uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, people <laughs> cycle a lot in, uh, in oh, yeah. Denmark, actually, and it's just really nice. So I have some friends that live about outside the city, and it's like a good hour and a half to cycle there. Oh, that's nice. And that's it nice. was, yeah, it was really nice, really necessary and really refreshing. And But I'm the kind of person that I, I it sounds terrible, but actually I like to work, especially working like on the device. And I, I just really like it. And I've, that's literally how this whole product has happened to become, basically. It was me at the beginning yeah. just having fun. And, and I, I, I love, like I said, I love discussing about it. I love uh, developing it. I love adding new function, testing it. It's just very exciting. Yeah. When you love what you do, you never have to work a day in your life. Yeah, yeah. you know, that's what I usually say to people, actually. I mean, lately, it's been a lot of work, you know, with the campaign and marketing stuff, which I don't necessarily like. Mm -hmm. um, but all the rest of the work, like working the actual device, when people ask me, like, oh, so do you work? And I say, no, I'm on the holidays all the time. And that's actually, actually true. Absolutely. Great, great. So how, yeah. how how many people are helping you out with this in all preparation for uh, the day after tomorrow? Well, we've had, I definitely have a new intern who is full time and that's a big help. Uh, he's been uh, he's been behind the camera as well. Uh, we did like a Facebook live, uh, uh, something like a couple of days. Uh, yeah, I think four days ago, actually. Yeah, so that, uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so he was behind the camera. Um, so he's been a lot of help, actually. He's done a lot of the writing and stuff like this. And then I have more marketing people. But all in all, I would say, like, any design of the device is 
it's basically me. Like I'm the only one who knows the device really inside out. Mm -hmm. um, who's made it? I made the code. I made the case. I made the electronics. Um, so it's all everything I was marketing. I just thought, if on top of doing everything on the device, I have to do all the marketing. I'm literally going to kill myself. So that's where <laughs> I really tried to get some people involved. I can um, imagine. Absolutely. But all in all, we're a small team, like of people in the actual company. We're like maybe three, four, we four. Yeah, currently. Oh, that's, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. That's and then, of course, um, uh, to follow up on one of my earlier questions. So what is your uh, experience up until now with working with the well, the, the crowdfunding uh, community? Um, as mentioned, initially, you were planning to go with Indiegogo. You're now going with Kickstarter. At yeah. least that's what the, the current plan is. Um, could you tell us a bit more about what the lessons uh, were that you learned up until now? So... Crowdfunding is, a, is an interesting world and it's not a world I knew actually before I started this. So it's difficult when it's your first crowdfunding campaign to have a successful campaign. It's what everybody says. Mm -hmm. um, and especially since my goal is quite high. Um, but in my opinion, it was never really crowdfunding actually. In my opinion, it was more like a pre-order kind of thing. And that's also yeah. why we built the exci you know, excitement on the website and everything to say, okay, you guys want this device, I've made a device, I just need you to kind of buy it before we make it so I have the money to make it. That's the yeah. way it was all the time. And, and my first idea was actually just literally to have a page with like a PayPal link. Yeah. <laughs> do you <laughs> want to, do, do, you, do, do you believe in this product enough to... Uh pay for it yeah absolutely yeah literally right and but then i thought okay people you know they don't know me they're not going to put their money on a random paper link from a guy on a website and i thought <laughs> and i thought if you put it in the platform like in the go go okay it's well known and uh, you know people will have more trust in this and that's yeah. where that's where i've learned that and that's mainly why we're changing from Indiegogo to kickstarter is people do not like indiegogo like they have this lack of trust in indiegogo oh um, and and I can see why actually. So it's a bit tricky, and it's a bit tough to say. I want to say because we've been working a bit with Indiegogo, and we actually had the campaign already set up and everything. But it's based on the feedback that some people kind of literally complain. They say, "Oh, I'm never buying anything on Indiegogo because it's a rip-off website." Um, and it's true because and it's not Indiegogo's fault, but it is a little bit. You know, it's a bit like when people criticize uh, Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg for not doing anything about what's happening on his platform. I would say it's a bit the same with Indiegogo, and I think they're trying to fight it. But basically, there are a lot of campaigns, or at least a certain amount of campaigns on Indiegogo that are just fake, mm -hmm. and it's just terrible. It's a horrible experience, and people are unhappy. They've paid something. They never get the goods or anything. And I don't think I want the Mijano to be associated with this in any way. Uh, obviously, we're not fake, and obviously, we want to send the device. I think at this point, it's pretty clear. But mm -hmm. in that way, Kickstarter, I think... Because the two platforms are very similar, like they have similar prices, similar like interface, similar pages, everything is almost the same. But Kickstarter is much stricter with the rules. They have a lot yeah. of rules that basically say you have to be honest, you have to be honest, you have to be honest. Don't try to oversell. Don't try to put the wrong price. Don't fake anything. Just be true and just say yeah. They're, they're Very experts. transparent as well. Yeah. Yeah, transparent and true, right? Well, I feel Indiegogo didn't get that vibe. And reading their rules, I can confirm this actually. So I really. I hope that people have more trust in Kickstarter, but I also feel it's better for the backers. Um, like, funny enough, I was literally setting up the page this morning Ooh, and wow. and uh, and Kickstarter asks for my credit card's details. And I was like, ah, it's interesting. Indiegogo didn't ask for that. So I'm just thinking, okay, let's say, you know, we do want to, you know, just take the money and run away. Well, they have my credit cards. They can actually take the money back. They can charge it back to you. Exactly. Yeah. They can charge it back. While they, uh, Indiegogo can't do that because they don't have the card, for example. Awesome, awesome. So yeah, that that's a that's a great approach, of course. Yeah. And I do think that it is also something uh, where I think that there were some modular crowdfunding initiatives initially. But what we typically see within modular is that it is typically like you've done is where people started with a a tremendous idea or they ran into something that they found frustrating and they then started develop. Uh, their own module or their own solution for that and they then say okay well my my problem is solved and then they start to see like you've like you've done hey but others like this as well yeah, so how true. do i mm -hmm. then actually how do you then scale up from being a just a a, a a diy enthusiast 
how do you then go from that to being a what we call in the eurex sphere a maker who actually makes modules and sells them and i i think that just going by what i've seen and what i've read and how i've come to understand the module uh, the sorry your your case currently is that yeah this the the, um, the, the you're aiming you're aiming high but for a good reason, because this is going beyond synthesizers. This is going beyond live. This is going beyond studio. This is going beyond um, anything else there as well. So yeah. uh, for, for those of us who, who don't know that yet, so what's your goal for, uh, for Tuesday? So <laughs> it's funny because in, on Kickstarter, on all these platforms, basically, you need a goal and money. Well, mm -hmm. my goal in my head was never in money. Is because yeah. when you start speaking number of, of, of yeah units, right? Yeah. It was literally number of units. Yes, exactly. Because when you start speaking with manufacturers and everything, you need a number to estimate because it's not, it doesn't cost the same to produce a thousand than to produce a hundred. Um, yeah. And I can already say, funny enough, electronics are very cheap nowadays. And actually, on the electronics, it makes a difference, but it's not as big as you would think. But stuff like the metal case, for example, there's a huge difference. If we make a hundred or if we make a thousand, it's just a lot cheaper. And I think yeah. it can go even cheaper if we make a lot more. And uh, and in that way, my goal in my head was always a thousand because I've made all my estimations for a thousand. Yeah. And maybe that's too high. So basically, I've made it in a way that I think if we sell five hundred uh, on Kickstarter, then we can still launch and we can still produce a thousand. That's enough overhead um, to produce a thousand. And and then sell like the five hundred that haven't been sold there um, to other places. Go through the normal channels. Go to Tormon. Go to Basically, those kind yeah. of places. Yeah. yeah. And Perfect. you know, I have um, speaking of Tormon, actually, I have a special relationship with Tormon uh, because I've bought all my gear there since I'm like <laughs> thirteen or something. So and and I've loved this company. It's a it's a family owned company, and I really they're just great. Their support is amazing. And when you read about how they treat their employees, the same thing, it's amazing. And I think it would be such an honor for me to have my product on, on that website. So that's <laughs> definitely goal number one. As soon as we have the campaign successful, I'll write to Tom and, and um, I'll, tell them, I'll tell them that I have a device that <laughs> has some Perfect. interest and that they, yeah. they should get it on their shelves. Have you already been in contact with Tom and, uh, on this before? No, I haven't actually. And I have oh, please do. No please idea. Do, all of the, yeah. the dealings I've had with Tomon, and uh, for me, of course, being a uh, being a content creator, I don't. I, I I never want to call myself an influencer. Or uh, the only thing I do is I spend a lot of my time talking to amazing people <laughs> like yourself. Uh, but what I've what I've learned from Tomon is that they are really willing to help and they are really willing to support and they go beyond anything that is Amazing. reasonable um so i i i i can immediately recognize that 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 boy like goal like well this is this is what i wanted this is what i wanted i want to have my gear on Tolman. But you're closer than you think. No worries. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And actually, you know, not surprised at all about what you said about Tommen, that yeah. they will help. And you're right. It's a good point. I we were thinking, basically, I guess I was worried because it's kind of, it's still a big company and I don't want to be this nobody that just says, hey, I've just made a device and uh, would you sell it? So that's, that's also the whole idea of the crowdfunding is both to get the money, but also to see the interest and have like the numbers basically it's then when i contact yeah. a company like tom and i tell them well i already have like 500 people that are interested that have bought one uh, yeah. that shows that shows this potential basically absolutely and and again if i may make any sort of um comments about that coming from a modular background even though it's just been a year um i reached out to modular makers a, y a year ago and said hey, I want to start my modular journey. I want to start creating uh, videos. I don't have a YouTube channel yet, but could you help me out? You don't want to know what kind of response I got. That was phenomenal. People okay. are really willing to help. So I, I truly hope that the modular community will uh, uh, follow along in, in supporting your Kickstart campaign that's going to start um, in, in two days. Because I think that... You've got a great solution to a problem that a lot of people within modular, within synthesizers, within bands, within music production have. And um, 
yeah, it's going to be fantastic, man. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you so much. And, 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 I'll, and I'll be there on uh, on Tuesday. Uh, uh, okay. credit card in hand to nice. order mine amazing <laughs> <laughs> amazing thank you so much absolutely yeah no, no yeah. worries no worries at least we can do and uh, of course uh, uh, on behalf of the whole modular society thanks for including uh, an analog clock <laughs> yeah and I hope like I say I hope you'll be used we had uh, at least one of our beta testers a guy in in all essentially that had a lot of fun with this and especially the fact that you had two clocks and you could change yeah. the and one thing he was doing was as he was playing he would go in the menu and change the speed of the clock to like kind of double or like change the triplets and and stuff like this as he was playing uh, oh that's great that's actually uh, really cool and it has a very diy it has made like a big box made of made of um wood actually where yeah. you put all his modules and stuff so it's very diy very like uh, and he, he does concerts with that that's pretty cool oh absolutely and uh, and that that's the the approach that uh, the modular team does um have you already gotten any feedback from people that have used this and why you say, okay, well, I've never intended the device for this kind of use, but it works, and I'm I'm surprised. Or have you have you have you been surprised, but with how people use it? Or well, you mean in the CV in the well, no, more more in general. Have you seen any sort of usage of yeah. this module where you say, okay, well, I've never intended it like that, but yes. I'm so super psyched that you can use it like that. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Actually. Yeah. Definitely has a lot of them have had some ideas say, Oh, but wait, you could use device to do this. And I was like, wait, you're right. I didn't think about this. And that's what I love about this device is actually there's so many usage, so many ways you can place it because it can, it does like a little bit of everything. It's like a little toolbox yeah. basically. And um, you know stuff like CV for example I would always think okay this stuff is only in the studio and that guy just took it live yeah. and, and used it live with all his CV gear all his uh, modular gear I was like okay interesting and then you could do this you could also sing it to a door and one guy recently mentioned uh, using it in orchestras uh, for theatre he said imagine like oh. a, a theatre you know a conductor mm -hmm. right that maybe, you know, nowadays they have like a few synths like this, but they don't use arpeggiators or sequences or something like no, this. No, 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 indeed, yeah. And he said, imagine someone just like the conductor, you know, be able to conduct the whole orchestra and at the same time just turn the button to kind of change the tempo and oh, on wow. while yeah. I was playing. It's just a very interesting idea. It's like, yeah, and, and this guy actually knows he's from the UK and he knows some people that are in the industry and, and that could potentially use it. Uh, as a conductor, like in theatre. Awesome. That was awesome, one, man. yeah, there was this, then there was um, uh, just people started using it uh, with the DJ equipment. This, I did not see that coming. There are actually some people ah, yeah. that do DJing live uh, with like a, you know, like a vinyl or something like this, mm -hmm. but at the same time play some synth and they need to have a MIDI clock sent to that, like from their DJ equipment. And I was like, okay, interesting. <laughs> Well, and even if you, um, I, I, I did dabble yeah. around in DJing when I was in uh, university, but if I'm not mistaken, even the CGI um, from Pioneer would have something like a clocking capability. Now, yes, just... yes, some of them actually have a uh, MIDI yeah. out, I think. Yeah. And if you then use that, because then, of course, it, if you then combine that with the, with the, with the metronome, you will actually have a whole lot of applicability to then sync it to any sort of device you want, uh, which you could, of course, done otherwise, but then you'll need much more than just one single case to do that. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. again, that's like the general idea with the metronome. Like, it, it, I would say it's not revolutionary, right? You can do the same with like a more complex setup. It just it's, it makes your life easy. Yeah. And and that's what, especially when you're on stage, it's nice to have your life easy when you're on stage. You have a million things to think about, like, you know, playing lyrics, the set list, is my guitar plugged in? And the groupies. Oh, yeah, the groupies, whatever. <laughs> what does this girl have a brow of? No, I don't know. Anything, like, very strange. And then you got to think about all this. And at the same time, you got to, you know, have complex gear to use. So it's it's nice to have a simple device that does the job. And especially, as you said, well, you might even just uh, use it without looking at it because you have that tactile feedback from the knob. Yes. So if you if mm -hmm. you need to just turn it up a notch, you can just give mm -hmm. it a give it a swig, just press the button, and you're good to go again. Correct. And actually, speaking of the tactile thing, so I mean, there's the big knob, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then also these buttons there. 
uh, it's hard one? to see on. Oh yeah, yeah. So ones. you've got the play and a pause and the mute one. And the mute, right? And then the tap tempo here. And they, uh, it's hard to see, but they light up actually. But they're also very physical button. Like people have complained about the fact that. Uh, you know, our competitor, actually, which I won't name, uh, uses no. something like rubber buttons and stuff, you know, doesn't have a tactile feel. Like this has a very nice clicky. Uh, this is a tap tempo, for example. Yeah. yeah. And it's just like it, uh, every button is very, you can, I don't know if you can hear it, but. Yeah, I can uh, hear it. And absolutely. That, that's it. exactly what you need then. So it's, yeah, strong feel. And you're right. Yeah, it's actually easy to use, like, even without looking at it because yeah. you have the feel. And, and one thing I've always been, um, and this is something I've, been thinking about for quite some time and that is visual feedback from a metronome in general um where in a in a life situation where you might want to say well we've we've got something like a an led panel that's going to tell anyone okay where well, where are we in the current in the current measure for instance and i'm not sure if that's ever been done but have you thought about those kind of things where you don't want to have Okay, well, uh, in in the case you described just now, your your drummer, uh, you need to pay extra attention to. Okay, well, where are we? How is the actual measure changing? Um, and I'm coming from a metal background, so where you have more, um, <laughs> you have let's say, interesting <laughs> interesting uh, things from a from a rhythm perspective and a tempo perspective. Yeah. So, has that ever been tried, to your knowledge? So literally following the tempo based on visuals. That's what you're asking, right? Yeah, yeah. I have tried it as a drummer. Uh, it's <clears throat> the answer is pretty much impossible. Like, like I don't know. The device actually has like an LED that shows you where the yeah. beats. So it lights up green on the first beat of the bar, and then it lights up red on the other beats. Yeah. So you could technically just look at it and see. Okay, there's the click, but. I'm not sure how our brains work, or maybe it's because musicians' mm -hmm. ears are better than eyes. But in my mind, it's really hard. Like, it, you can see it, but you don't really, until you hear the click, until you hit tick, 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 it's really hard to just follow a click just visually. Um, like, you'll be able to follow it, you know, kind of work a bit around it, but at some point, you'll drift. It's, it's yeah. like literally impossible to just keep playing as a drummer without hearing a click. Yeah, just, just based on the, well, physical or um capability distance that we have between the visual and the auditory realm in our in the way our brains are linked together i guess yeah it must be yeah i'm far from an expert in the area but yeah i would say well, i'll, I'll throw like this, this to some uh to some friendly neuro scientists yes, who might be able to figure that out yeah it's something that i've always thought about because of course well um back in the day you had the the, the actual physical metronomes uh, which had, of course, on the one hand, the the auditory signal, the the, the, the click, 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 but also the actual pendulum just swinging around. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, how does that relate to what we now want to use to make sure that, um, let's let's call them the the virtual uh, artists, like um, like sequences, like arpeggiators. Um, how will they then work together with the well? The, the, the human talent on the stage uh, being, for instance, a drummer, it could be a guitarist, a, a bass player, um, even, a, even, even a key player if they don't depend on any, any sort of triggering. So how do we then make sure that we tie that together and have something like a, well, let's call it a, again, a connective tissue of sorts. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, your approach that you've got here where you have the capability to have a, Vi uh, an audible click track an audible playing click, together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean there is this company called the uh, Sound Brenner. I think they made this wearable um, mm -hmm. <coughs> metronomes, and yeah, so like the um, like the smart watches with the tactile feedback. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But these ones, like if you go on their website, they say it's much stronger. Right. It's like it's designed to be a metronome, basically. Um, so like I would still say you know we spoke about senses right there's the eyes for me the eyes is literally impossible uh, mm -hmm. then the ear is the normal way right but this one uses like the touch basically where you just feel the metronome you feel it kind of like pulsing and that apparently is uh, works pretty well at least uh, I've never tried it myself but uh, people say you know you can attach something to your chair as a drummer and your chair vibrates then yeah. it's just like uh, it works nicely to feel it well, maybe, maybe if I want to go one step further, because one thing I always see, and this is especially true for drummers, and I've, I know a lot of drummers and I know a lot of people 
uh, from, from my metal background. And the one thing that drummers will always do, they start moving. The moment they want to mm-hmm. understand mm-hmm. a rhythm, they start to they start to move around. They say, yes. okay, well, this is how it should be. Yeah. And whether, and especially in the more progressive kind of metal, when you talk about gent and all of the, the more jazzy uh, kind of uh, polyrhythms that are thrown in there, they need that movement. So how about we just cut out the middleman and instead of just using sound, where we just put electrodes on their <laughs> on their body, so we immediately have that that, that physical true. feedback into mm-hmm. them. Might that even even be a more um, optimized shortcut? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it it would work. Like I said, companies have done it. So awesome. But yeah, it's going to be a crazy crazy time. And as long as everything is uh, able to be uh, connected through MIDI or CV, <laughs> yeah. it's going to, it's going to yeah. talk to the metronome. Yeah, actually, I haven't even looked at uh, if the sound brenner would integrate with the metronome, um, but so far hasn't. Nobody has asked for it, something like this. So, um, I'd be happy to look into it if people are interested in this. Well, um, I, w- I would, I would mm-hmm. assume. But again, when you when you assume you make an ass out of you and me, um, that, it's, that it has some sort of capability to be synced to MIDI, and once it's got that, then it's of course capable of yes. uh, syncing yeah. to uh, to the metronome mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, media or, um, or the post. That's also what's nice about this CV clock out is mm-hmm. it's a very simple, it's basic post. So you can uh, you can sync a lot of things to that. Even things that are not supposed to be synced because you just have I've got a I've got a voltage uh, pulse coming in and that can trigger a lot of things. Yeah, basically you just trigger things. Yeah. Yeah. I promised Correct. you I would only take approximately an hour of your time, and here we are, almost ninety minutes in. So I do have to apologize for that. That's so fine. <laughs> I always have two final questions, and yeah. um, um, I think that's probably the time for today to uh, to throw them out. So, if you were to go back to, let's say, two three years ago, just before Corona hit, and <laughs> if you were to give Simon one piece of advice, what would that be? Oh, it's a toughie. <laughs> that's a tough one I mean I, I really enjoyed the last two years like it's mm-hmm. been a lot of fun um, awesome the part that I didn't enjoy was the marketing part uh, I have mm-hmm. this thing and my team knows it very well like, I just really don't like marketing uh, like I'm still shocked how people love this video like the video you spoke about that's just yeah. black uh, which in my mind is it looks great but doesn't show anything it doesn't tell you anything it just shows the device looking pretty and that's it and people love yeah. that video it has had so much more success on Facebook than than for some of the other videos we've made that show a lot mm-hmm. more of the features and stuff yeah um, but in that way so I have this hate of marketing so like the advice could be you know hire a marketing team and don't even think about it like hire a company to do all the marketing so I don't have to set a foot in marketing. They can market the product. I can focus on making it and speaking to the people. I can imagine. That's a like, good one. That, that would be my biggest thing because I, and I did work with other people and stuff like this, but I didn't just put the money in it basically. And I think it would have been worth it. Awesome. Well, <laughs> and, and then again, that is something that, 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 that tells you about who you are, what you want to do, how you want to focus and spend your energy. And there are, of course, um, hundreds of other people that would love to do marketing for you. Yes. Who would get? Who would truly get a kick out of that? And yeah, as you said, I haven't had to work a day during the last two years because <laughs> I'm just doing what I love. Yes. And 100%. I think that that is the great thing. And I, I'm assuming, or maybe I should rephrase that. I am hoping that the people that are now running your marketing department are feeling the exact same thing. That they say, well, I'm doing exactly what I want to do. And it feels like a dream. And yeah. um, for me, I had a I, I had a whole other dream back when I was uh, growing up. I always wanted to work for a software company. And because that was late 80s, early 90s. And now I'm doing that. And that is exactly how it should be. Because then, of course, if you do what you love, it doesn't feel like working. Agreed, yeah. And um, no, that's great. So the other thing I take from, from your piece of advice is, of course, to learn how to delegate, how to, how to, how to hand off responsibilities to others that you 
uh, will yeah. need to depend upon, but also mm-hmm. but who you will need to trust because it's your yeah. baby, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and you know, actually, that's the funny thing. You, like, it's the hardest thing, I would say, in this whole thing is to be able to, like you say, to pass on the trust. And yeah. uh, like, literally, like you say, it is my baby. And when you've worked on something for so long and stuff like... For example, with the interns that I've had uh, to do marketing, it took them a while to actually understand what the device does. And mm-hmm. some of them are not from the music world, but some of them were actually. And it still took them a while like to you know, to kind of really get it. And and they wouldn't be able to answer technical questions, stuff like this. Yeah. So it, it's... I find it difficult. That, that might be me. I, I find it difficult to work with people. Like I'm, I'm a very, I'm very good at making things. I'm not so good at working with others. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm really trying to improve on this uh, and really trying to open up. Um, no, that's a good point. But yeah. So h- how how are you approaching that? Is there something specific that you follow along to improve yourself or to recognize? Okay, but this is something I. I shouldn't be doing, but I need to offload that to someone else. You mean to choose who does what? Well, maybe, maybe, but also where you said, okay, well, um, and, and, and I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm just picking some of the, the, the things you just said, where you said, okay, well, I don't really like working with people. And of course, I know that that's not entirely, that's not 100% of the truth, but it is something that you said, <laughs> okay, well, that's something that is sometimes troubling for me and that is no problem whatsoever as i said i come from an it world i know exactly when people say those things <laughs> i think but, you're right yeah. i think if i may rephrase it it's it's more like um i think i'm really good at what i do mm-hmm. and i'm someone Absolutely. who i'm someone who works very hard like i i can work very hard at learning stuff and like i've told to adam actually one of my marketing interns yeah I'm actually not that bad at marketing. And I told him, that's depressing. I shouldn't be good at marketing. I should, because I don't like it. I don't want to be good at it. <laughs> and and I told him, that's, in that way, it's, it's bad. And because I have such a high standard, I would say, then I'm, I put such a high standard on people. And if they're not up to my standard, then I'm like, oh, you know what? I could do that better. And then I kind of take this stuff away from them. So in that way, I'm not I'm not that good working with them. I, I need to mm-hmm. kind of accept to say, okay, you do this and that's going to be your stuff and I stay away from it. Yeah. And that is something that kind of I think that, that, that every everyone will need to learn uh, someday or another. And that is, of course, to... Um, and this is something my um, <laughs> my wife and my kids tell me uh, all the time as well. And they sometimes sing it to me and then they say, let it go. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then I'm like, do. oh, no, no. And then I know exactly what's going to happen. Then the f- next couple of minutes is going to be, let it go. And I'm, no. To the sing in English show in Dutch, how does that work? Uh, for us, it's both. So, okay. uh no, the <laughs> the kids, they, 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 they watch everything in English. And okay. So they, well, I, typically, well, growing up, all of the cartoons we watched here in the Netherlands were all either subbed uh, and not that many were dubbed. So we all had a, a lot of access to to English language or American, you might say, uh, content. And nowadays, a lot more things are indeed uh, dubbed Dutch. And I'm like, well, I want to give my kids the same advantage that I've got uh, being, well, de facto raised bilingual. And I've had so much pleasure just from having that, yeah. just by being able to speak a lot more uh, languages than just one, uh, where you are indeed. And that's, of course, what, that, that's a Dutch thing, of course, where we can all speak uh, Dutch, French, German, English, and all those kind of things. But we need to make sure that we keep that in place. So that's one of the things I, want, I like to instill, or at least well, stimulate uh, within my kids as well. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't, couldn't agree more, actually, yeah. Well, Language especially for so a Frenchman, uh, as you said, well, uh, living in living in Denmark, I would then make the assumption that you also have yes. a, at least a possible command mm-hmm. of the Danish language. And the funny thing is then, because of the mutual intelligibility between uh, the Danes, the Norwegians, the Swedes, and... Um, uh, to, and to my knowledge, the lesser extent of the Icelandic, Icelandic languages. Yeah, a little bit. Right. Then you can immediately make yourself known. And, um, That's true. 
And then, of course, I do recognize a couple of uh, twangs in your English that, that tell me a bit more that you uh, have had quite some experience in Essex in the, uh, in the UK as well. <laughs> in, did you say in Essex? Essex, yeah. Okay, it's very specific. Because, <laughs> no, because that, that is, and, and that might be the, yeah. the, 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 the Pyrenean French that I hear uh, well, that has a bit of that twang, and if you then combine that with yeah. uh, with English, it, it does sound a bit like Essex. Okay, interesting. Yeah, it's a bit of a mix. Yeah, I, yeah, it's nice. Yeah. It's nice to hear that. And I'm and I'm really <laughs> big on accents. I'm really like yeah, I like, like I to people tell. to pinpoint people. Yeah. Uh, but then again, I digress again, and I'll just keep keep on talking. Uh, but it's interesting to hear the the journey that you've been on and the the approach that you've yeah. uh, that you've done but also the things that you've recognized okay well how mm -hmm. can i improve or how, how can you yeah. improve being a well yes. let's just let, let let's let's fast forward to uh to two years from now where the uh, midonom release was a big success you've you've hired uh 50 people <laughs> How do you then foresee the role that you will have in that company? Do well, you want to be the CEO or do you want to be the product manager? They are absolutely not the CEO. This I know. <laughs> and I mean, like like you said, I think it's uh, it's important to to acknowledge kind of what you're good at and what you're not good at. And that's what mm -hmm. I say when I say I'm not good with people. Like I'm I'm not a people's person. And mm -hmm. I'm okay with it. Like it doesn't make me a horrible person. I still have friends and and I have a girlfriend and I I like yeah. people, but working with people is maybe like, I don't like to delegate. I wouldn't, I don't think I'd be a good manager, for example. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. for now, obviously I'm the manager because it's a tiny team. But like you say, in, in two years from now, say I hire 50 people, I'm definitely not the CEO. I have a hired CEO or a partner CEO. Um, <clears throat> that can and you take just want to people. focus on the success of the product? Yes. And then, you know, what? That's, that would be amazing. It means that I can still own the company. But what do I do? I just do what I've been doing the last two years. I designed Midronome 2.0 or <laughs> 5.0, whatever version we have. <laughs> and, and just make that sure that perfect. you still don't have to work for a day in your life where you just enjoy what you're doing. Yeah, that's true. To, but to be honest, another thing about the two years from now is it will be reducing my work hours. Um, because as much as it's been it's been nice to work that intensely, but I'm also at an age where I'd like to kind of take a step back and say, okay, this really nice project. I would also like to have a life outside work, uh, which I haven't really had the last two years. And I'm assuming your girlfriend would be very thankful if you yes. get to that point as well. <laughs> she is so tired of hearing me talking about it. You have no idea. Like, <laughs> well, I can, I can, I can, I can, yes. I can make make an assumption there. So yes. just just for my understanding, and we haven't talked about that at any point, but how old are you currently? I'm 32. Yeah, 32. So uh, yeah, don't no, have kids. No, but then I understand exactly mm -hmm. what you uh, what, what you're going for. So you you were saying? Yeah, I'm just saying I don't have kids, and I do think I want to have kids uh, like any time soonish. Mm -hmm. uh, I just need a stable situation financially, and and yeah, work related and and kind of settle down a little bit a little bit more into a routine i would say yeah um, i can imagine i can imagine but and your enough, girlfriend uh, she's she's, li she's living close by or is she in, in france or is she with you in, no she, in lives, she lives here she lives oh here. great yeah uh, we live good. together in denmark uh, and she's no, yeah she's british actually so that's also where i got the accent from uh so is she not, from essex then or no she's not from? from essex she's from london uh, uh but that's why yeah, I don't know where I got the Essex thing. Um, that might be just a, a Pyrenean French combined with a bit of yeah. London. I'm just thinking out loud here. Because what you typically say is you uh, you can get the girl out of Essex, but you can't get the Essex out of the girl. So, um, Interesting. Yeah, but that, 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 so now, <laughs> now I'm, surpri now I'm surprised yeah. to hear that. But then again, no worries. Um, I've got a ton of other questions for you, Simon, and I'm yeah. really happy that I was able to pick your brain. Um, let's make sure that we have a follow-up question, a follow-up questionnaire with an audience, um, no, post the actual launch. 
Yeah, that would be amazing. Actually, I'd be more than happy to. And and if some people are watching this and have some questions, uh, then please write them down. We can discuss them next time. That would be really cool. That's great. That's absolutely great. And I'll uh, make sure to. Uh, uh, to gather some questions on the Discord channel mm -hmm. to um, to get some questions for you. Amazing, uh, yeah. But for now, then then always my last question for everyone I interview is: mm -hmm. I've had the well the honor and the privilege to interview you for the last um, ninety seven minutes. But I do want to return the favor. Do you have any question, or what would be your number one question to me? Okay, that's uh, interesting. Yeah. Well. My question to you would be how, like, what was your first reaction when you saw the device? Like when you went on the website, I don't know where you saw it, actually, if it was I saw Facebook. it on Facebook, actually. Okay. I saw it on Facebook in one of the, uh, in one of the ads and I'm like, well, hey, this is interesting. I'm like, hey, because this is something and I'm not a big musician. I'm a uh, music enthusiast. I'm a music production enthusiast. I am uh, blessed by a um, by the capability to to dive into music gear and and music technology, but the one thing I truly lack is talent, and um, that's always good to to, to tell. But then again, I saw the metronome and I'm like, well, hey, this is something that I've heard people complaining about all the all the way back to the late 90s early 2000s when i was still doing metal bands and um uh, performing where we always were struggling with okay so how do we make sure things are in sync and especially in um high speed high variety and also quite complex um, scenarios like metal music and what i've now come to understand also the more um experimental electronic music that has been a challenge throughout the last couple of decades uh, where you see that there were several ways to approach that, uh, whether they were software related, but there never was, at least to my knowledge, and again, I do have to acknowledge that I'm still a noob in a lot of things, a one size fits almost every use case out there. Mm. and. That's one of the reasons why I reached out, why I say, okay, well, this is something I immediately see applicability, usability, okay. but also a, well, uh, 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 in my white space analysis of the overall uh, music world, this is something that has never been solved in such an elegant way. So that's, that's one of the things I, I saw in you. Okay. Did you get that from that video? You saw the the dark video on Facebook, right? The one with the black background. Um, no, I think I, I think the thing I saw and that was like maybe two weeks ago. That was actually just a, an image, but it could have been the dark video. And then I read the the like the the the, the elevator pitch, the five mm. the five sentence description, mm -hmm. and I'm like, well, hey that triggered me into mm -hmm. like hey nice. i want to know more <laughs> i went nice to the to website I, yeah. I i saw that and See, that, I... that's my marketing skills <laughs> yeah <laughs> no elevate, absolutely elevator pitch actually yeah no but that's that's exactly what you need because as you are coming from a uh very musical oriented approach combine that with a um what i like to call a binary way of thinking that people within IT typically have is uh, something is A or B, it's zero mm -hmm. or one. Mm -hmm. And we know and we understand that if we say it needs to be done in this approach, it needs to be done in that approach. Whereas people who are not capable of thinking binary might say, yeah, but I, I, I did it so it looked like it. Yeah, but that's not the same. And that approach to product development in the music scene is something that we see a lot more prevalence in nowadays as uh, devices become predominantly digital. Uh, but then again, you'll also you'll always have that um, that disconnect between the musician's requirements versus the developer's interpretation of that. And you have embodied both of that into, well, your single being, and that's impressive. 
and you've then turned that into something where you saw a a gap or a uh, a need within the musical world, and you applied yourself to developing that. And I think that that is something that you should be lauded for. Okay, thank thanks so much for the nice words. Yeah, no <laughs> and, worries, and, no worries. Yeah, and nice to hear that was your reaction. Actually, I always wonder how people react when they see that the first elevator pitch, but then also the video. Um, and if they go on the website or if don't, if they just start writing things. And, uh, but I guess you, yeah. you dig you dig further, right? Like you saw the stuff and you started thinking and then you kind of clicked on the website, started reading things. and Yeah, because immediately, and I'm, I'm, I'm just as guilty of that as anyone else, is when I see something, if I read something, I immediately start filling out the blanks and I make assumptions and I mm -hmm. want to then understand it and I dive deeper into it. And um, that then results in... For me, of course, and that's the luxury I have, is I have the propensity to then reach out to the makers directly and yeah. say, hey, well, um, I've got no idea. I want to understand this better. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, want to give my audience a chance to listen to that as well. And of course, yeah, the benefit for you is then, of course, that you have an audience uh, that yeah. you, uh, or a stage <laughs> We talk about those things as well. Yes, it's and that is that is something that I truly love. And there is always something that is very comforting to the people that I talk to is I don't pretend to know anything. No, <laughs> so where I'm okay. where I'm truly like, okay, well, educate me, tell me what, well, well, how will this work? Mm -hmm. And I I can make certain assumptions, but I want to either validate them or I want to well um, uh, throw out any of the assumptions I've made. And that's something I truly love. Very cool. I have to say, um, like my own feedback with this interview actually has been really nice because it's. Uh, I love the way you direct the interview and the way you know it's very like um, just general questions, basically not necessarily only about the device, but also you know about the journey and about myself and like kind of. I love this idea, uh, that kind of, <clears throat> kind of getting to know the person behind the thing and. Uh, getting a bit more than than just oh so here's the device you can do this and this and this um yeah and i think that that is uh thank you so much for that and that, that means a lot to me but again because once i got to know you once i understand a bit more about you and i then understand the device much better but also the journey behind it and i think that that is something because as I always said, and this is something I've stolen from, from a colleague of mine, is people buy from people. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, that is true if you want to say, well, I, I want to, I, I believe in this product. I want to go for this product. And it's always better to understand what the story behind it is. Yeah. Because we are storytellers uh, uh, as as a human race, right? That's we true. love to hear these stories. So That's well, true. Yeah. yeah, it's very human feeling. Yeah, and indeed. So one thing I'm going to do is hopefully I've got some time later tonight to um, put this into a lot of things, and I might just decide to put the the raw recording online ASAP uh, because I want to get this out to the public as soon as possible. Yeah. Uh, not, not just necessarily because I want to get it out for the four, for the 15th, uh, but I want to make sure that as many of my audience are able to see this before it's Tuesday, and then they can decide for themselves whether yeah. they, 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 they see this as something that I see this being as a tremendous opportunity to, to improve mm -hmm. workflows. Yeah, it is, it is um, to be fair for them if they want to make it to the uh, the early birds as well, right? Because if they get that's the information also good too point. late, absolutely, uh, then uh, then it's uh, then they can't have it at the the early bird price. Yeah, let's let's make sure that we give them the chance mm -hmm. to uh, save yeah. a few bucks or a few euros. Um, yeah, no, as has said, Simon, I do truly appreciate you taking the time on this Sunday uh, oh, afternoon. My pleasure. Uh, please extend my apologies to your girlfriend or anyone else that okay. might have been waiting for it's you to uh, to join for for other things. As said, let's make sure that we uh, we follow up after the kickstart, see how it went. Yeah, and absolutely. Um, yeah, as always, uh, people, I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure that we leave all of the details uh, for the Midronome for Simon and for all the other links that we mentioned earlier in the description down below. 
I said, this has been a, a presentation of the modular clubhouse. If you're in any sort of uh, position to, uh, to, to to have a quick look at Simon's website at Midrenome, was it again? Midrenome.com, right? Yeah, yes, perfect. Give that a look. If you've got any questions, um, yeah, you might ask me, but I might not have all the answers. Probably better to just reach out to uh, to Simon or maybe just join the forums on the uh, Midrenome website. Yeah. And or they can uh, write down and yeah. then we can discuss it next time. That's Indeed. Well, that, that's a good point. Definitely. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll start a thread on Discord as well um, to, uh, to just gather any sort of questions we might have on the Midrenome. And we can uh, take that to our next call, which is probably yes. going to be in a couple of weeks. I'll, yeah. I'll make sure. I don't want to uh, overstress you as well, Sam, because the no, next couple okay. of days are going to be uh, extremely. They're uh, going to be intense. <laughs> could you show us your nails? So how how are your nails currently? They're okay, actually. I don't do I don't do nails thing. Oh yeah. Oh, I, you don't, I don't bite nails. I don't oh. bite nails. Oh, I, I wish I, I mean, would to be, be able to say the same, but yeah. That's true. <laughs> to be honest, it's, like, it's a lot of work, but it's okay. Like I don't feel stressed or anything. I just I just work. It's it's constant, you know. It's not like crazy. It's just constant, and that's perfect. It's yeah. For now, it's okay. <laughs> no, for, for now, now it's, it's been great. Absolutely, I'm yes. really impressed, Simon. Uh, so you. with that, I want to say, um, everyone, thanks again for listening to this recording uh, of the Modular Clubhouse. Uh, Simon, thanks again for your time. Thank and you so much. for now, I would say everyone, wherever you are in the world, um, stay safe. Stay healthy. And for those of you who are currently being impacted uh, by war, genocide, or anything else, um, I wish you the best. And if in whatever kind of situation you are and you think that I can help, feel free to, um, to let me know. If I can help in any sort of way, let's make sure that we all uh, get through this together. Nice Thanks message. so much. Cheers. Message.